I'd like to welcome you all to the Wednesday weekly webinar. This is number nine in a series of ten. So next week is our final webinar. And our speaker today will be Cliff Hall. I'm, I have a couple things to share I'd, before we begin. So next week, as I mentioned, is our final webinar of the series. Uh, it's going to be featuring Todd Weinman. who will be talking about introducing youth to gardening, which is always a great thing for all of us with interest in growing food to do. So please try to join us for that. Same time, same place, same link. Uh, I think you've all figured out the system because I see many familiar names. But if you have any questions along the way, you can just type those questions in on the chat pod. That's number five on this list. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have archived all of the webinars. So if you wanted to hear one, you can certainly just go to the Field to Fork website. And you'll be able to click on the link, which takes you to YouTube. And you'll be able to watch any of the webinars that we've done along the way. And we now have, by the end of this, we will have 24 different topics available. And they're taught by lots of experts from, North, from NDSU and from other places. Uh, one thing I ask, and you've all been great about doing this, is to fill out the short survey that comes as a follow-up after the webinar. I had to turn in a report actually today. And I had nearly 600 respondents to the surveys that we've done through the course of doing these webinars. You can't understand how valuable it is to have that data to share back with the funding agency. So much appreciated. And please continue to give us your feedback. I will be um, drawing some names for prizes after next week. I'm still waiting for the prize to be finalized. Um, we're actually creating a new piece, and that's what the prize will be. Mm. And I'll send out a lot of them. So get your name in there multiple times. So I am pleased to um, introduce my friend and colleague, Cliff Hall. We've worked extensively together and done a lot of workshops together through the years. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Cliff. He completed his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin in River Falls, a master's and doctorate at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the area of food science and technology. Dr. Hall is a professor in the Department of Cereal and Food Sciences, actually in the Plant Sciences Department. And he oversees research on pulse quality and utilization of pulses in food systems, as well as overseeing the annual U.S. Pulse Quality Survey. Cliff has been extensively involved with students at NDSU. In fact, he's advised 11 PhD students, 12 master's students, and mentored over 30 undergraduate researchers and served on numerous committees. So he has a lot of experience in teaching and also working with students. So with that, I will introduce Cliff. And he's going to talk to us about canning low and high acid foods and certainly Type in your questions if you have questions along the way. So thanks, Cliff. All right. Thank you, Julie, for the introduction. Uh, for today's topic, as Julie mentioned, we'll really talk about canning. Uh, what's important about canning is that there's been a renewed interest in this particular area. Um, for a while there, I think we as a, a industry kind of went away from canning. Um, and, and from the food perspective or food science perspective, uh, we're looking at alternative approaches to, to replace the canning methodologies. However, for local foods and for, for gardeners, canning is probably an excellent option uh, for some foods. And so for today, I will, I will uh, highlight again for you as a refresher, some food characteristics. Uh, essentially, uh, the, the pH characteristics of, of foods. Uh, we also will then discuss uh, some canning basics. I won't cover every small detail, but I'll give you some highlights. Uh, talk about internet canning and, and some work that we did at NDSU. And then we will. Um, highlight some places where you can find additional information 
And then uh, if you have questions, I'll, I'll try to cover some of those um, at the end or during the presentation. So the FDA or Food and Drug Administration broadly defines uh, processed foods um, related to canning into three categories, either acid, low acid, or acidified. And their definition is, is really simply based on an acidity that is measured uh, based on a pH scale. So that's really um, what they or how the FDA defines uh, these different categories. And if we take a look at these in a little bit more detail, what we find is that low acid foods have a pH of 4.6 or above 4.6. Um, so when you look at the, the products such as uh, pumpkin and carrot and okra, these are all products that, that are considered low acid. So their pH values generally are right around uh, pH of 5. You start to get into corn and, and uh, green beans and mushrooms. These are now products that are in that 6 to 6.5 six uh, pH range. So you can see then that when we talk about low acid, uh, it's basically uh, pH values above 4.6. Acidic foods, in contrast, are those that have a pH of 4.6 or lower. So this would be down at the, the lower end of the scale um, where we'd have foods such as uh, pears, uh, apples, cherries, strawberries, uh, and the like. So again, that would be an acidic uh, food um, and would be treated different than a low acid food. If it's an acidified food, an acidified food is a, a food that is considered low acid that has an, an acid added to it to make it um, acidic in nature. What's really important about an acidified food is that um, it has a final, the, the product itself has a final equilibrium pH of 4.6 or lower after it's been sitting in the uh, acidifying acid, for example, for a week to four weeks. Uh, so it's very, very important to understand when you're dealing with an acidified food that you don't do the pH right after it's made, but instead you wait about a week to four weeks depending on the, the, the food product because you want to have an equilibrium pH of 4.6 or, or lower. So that's considered the acidified uh, food. Of course, many of you already know uh, fruits, pickles, sauerkrauts, that all belongs to that acid food category, the low acid food category. Anytime you're dealing with meat or a milk-based product, that's in that low acid category. And the majority of your, your vegetables all would be in this low acid uh, category as well. Tomatoes and figs are a little bit different in that they kind of cross between both of these categories in the sense that some tomatoes are actually acidic in nature um, as well as some figs, but then if grown in a, a soil that's very alkaline in nature, they might actually have a pH that would go above that 4.6 value, so they'd be then a low acid food. So it's very important to kind of make sure that when you're making products that you understand um, will that product itself by nature be an acid or not. If it's borderline, that's when you bring in uh, acids like lemon juice or citric acid or vinegar to help reduce that pH and making sure that it stays below that uh, 4.6 value. So again, uh, keep in mind that not all foods will necessarily uh, be either acid or low acid. Some can be actually kind of right at that border. So what's important then when we discuss canning is to really go to the USDA guidelines for canning, whether it's an acid food or low acid food. Uh, the National Center for uh, home food preservation 
um, at the University of Georgia kind of holds the record for for a lot of this home preservation and, and they have all the USDA guidelines listed. So it's important that if you have a person that contacts your office and asks about canning, um, that's where I would really send them first is to say, well, this is a site that you can maybe read through some of the frequently asked questions or uh, you can read through maybe a, a product that you might be interested in, in making. Uh, because there's a lot of details out there and sometimes it's just better to, to send them right directly to this USDA guidelines. So based on, on these guidelines then, uh, we currently have two home processing methods that are, are done uh, with a great understanding in the sense that the USDA has done a lot of research in these two uh, particular uh, processing methods. With the boiling water canning, this is simply uh, boiling the, that canned product in water. And at, two, uh, at sea level, keep in mind that that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. This particular type of method is for acid foods and foods that are, have been acidified. So that's, uh, again, a, a method that's appropriate for these types of food. Um, however, when we start to look at low acid foods, uh, pressure canning is the approach that we have to take. Um, with pressure canning, keep in mind that, that it's not only for low acid foods, but it's also for mixtures of acid and, and low acid foods. So if you have, an, uh, say, an okra that's chopped up in some tomatoes, in that particular case, even though your tomatoes might be acidic, your okra is not, so it still falls in this this uh, kind of category where you want to do a pressure canning. What's important to remember here is that your temperature with pressure canning reaches about 240 degrees Fahrenheit, so much higher than that of a boiling water bath canner. And this is important because at 240 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, there's enough energy in that system to destroy spores that might be present uh, within some of the organisms that are of concern to us. So you have to have that high temperature to be able to do that. One other thing I do want to point out is that uh, home produced low acid foods cannot be sold to the public. So that's something that's, that's um, universally accepted. Uh, companies that do it for a business have a lot of safeguards in place. So companies that are selling products that might be of low acid foods, uh, they basically have much stricter requirements in, in their facilities than you might at home. And so it's important to recognize that uh, you can still make low acid foods or can low acid food products at home for your consumption, but you just can't sell it to the public. So again, just recognizing um, low acids are really the one that we're most concerned with. Cliff? And what? Yes? Um, how about when we go to farmer's markets and see like home canned green beans or those, those items? What do we do when we see it? Um, I, I would maybe contact the, the health department, the North Dakota okay. Department of Health, because I think they're the ones that oversee, um, that oversee the, what can be sold at the farmer's markets. Well, and I even think of salsas, because sometimes they use their own recipes and may or may not have canned them in a uh, pressure canner. Yeah, and, and, um, and that, that's something that, um, you know, I've had a lot of requests recently of, of product pH testing, where some of the individuals say, well, we contacted the, the state health department. So it seems there's a lot of people that are starting to be aware of things, but it really is a case where um, to, to see if they have evidence for that. I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, do you have evidence? So it might be even worthwhile to maybe stop by and just chat with them a little bit. And I don't know, Julie, do you have other comments? Um, well, currently, there is a guideline sheet on the North Dakota Department of Health website 
and it expressly says that low acid foods cannot be sold and so on. So that will be in effect through the end of August. There was some new legislation that I'm not sure of the final version that has just come out. But, I mean, for safety, nobody wants to be selling something that actually could be fatal, <laughs> which in the case of home canned water bath green beans could be, as yep. in the picture you're looking at right now. <laughs> So um, currently, follow those guidelines are on the North Dakota Department of Health website, food and lodging, and I think that will give you your answer. Okay, thank you, Julie. So yeah, I think that, that if you see somebody, just kind of point them in the right direction that they need to be following those guidelines. And as Julie mentioned, you know, the concern that we have is by not understanding what our product is and how to process it correctly can lead to uh, to death. And so it can be severe. Um, and this is something from the, the 30s where where a number of, of individuals died and, and passed away. So it's important to, to, yeah, if you see that, definitely point them in the right direction or if you have to, if you see it repeatedly, maybe it's it's something that you might even want to alert just uh, the the health department about. Uh, but one of the organisms that we're most concerned with, and this has been the one that the food industry as a whole, from the canning industry, um, have an interest in, is um, clustered in botulinum. So any canned food product. Clustering botulinum is that organism that uh, is most concerned. And, and the reason for that is it is what we define as this obligated anaerobe. Uh, an an obligated anaerobe is one that, that grows under very low oxygen uh, content, so less than 2%. So the oxygen content in that, that product has to be lower than 2%. And so for canned products, that's easily achieved. And so uh, this organism, if, if not um, effectively killed, can grow under canned food environments. Um, but also clustered botulinum is a toxin producer. Uh, the botulism toxin is one of the deadliest known toxins. And it's what is the reason or the basis for this botulism food poisoning. So if you get botulism, you're ingesting this toxin is what you're doing. Uh, one of the things is, is that um, the, there is an antidote available, but keep in mind that sometimes it might take a while for a doctor to diagnose what you actually have. So unless you tell them, well, I ate canned green beans or canned peas, um, that would be the only way that might alert them to botulism. So if you never mention that, they might think it's some other other uh, disease and it might take a while for a diagnosis. So just be aware of that, that yes, there is an antidote, but it has to be properly administered. Also, um, the, the food itself that contains the toxin um, does not necessarily show signs that there's anything wrong with it. So it might look normal. It's just that the uh, the toxin itself isn't something that's going to be visible. So it, it's a it's a basically a chemical. So it's uh, one that again keep in mind uh, that when we we talk about clostridium botulinum, it's really the toxin that's the the, the biggest issue. We also um, know that clustering botulinum produces spores that are heat resistant and that the heat resistance is, is really critical here because remember what I said earlier, we need that high temperature of 240 to really kill off the, the spores um, and if we don't then that really leads to uh, the problem that we face and, and that is the production of that toxin. So essentially when what we have is we have the clostridium botulinum and it has a spore. You expose this to some sort of heat treatment and so if it's a water bath canner for example, 
it gets to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's not enough to actually uh, do anything but stress that spore. Okay, it kills off the vegetative or live bacteria, but that spore, it just triggers it to become active. And so what happens then is that it germinates. And if this germination occurs while it's under this anaerobic environment of a can, this bacterium starts to grow. Because remember I said that it was an anaerobic organism. So, so it grows, multiplies, and then it excretes waste material and toxins. So this is kind of a, the, the cycle that happens if in an improperly canned uh, low acid food. So again, we need anaerobic conditions, low acid uh, environments, temperatures of 40 to 120. So if it's sitting in your cupboard at 70 or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, ideal locate, uh, temperature. And then, of course, high moisture, which canned foods are. So it, it is a case where, again, this is uh, that cycle of, of what happens in order for this toxin to be produced. Well, how do we prevent botulism? Well, the first thing is to inhibit spore germination. Because one thing we do know is that you can eat spores of Clostridium botulinum. And so if you eat these spores, they don't really do anything to healthy ad adults, okay? Infants, yes, they can, but not for, for uh, you, people usually over one year of age. Um, so what we find here is that, that if we can inhibit the germination, um, that will uh, effectively control Clostridium botulinum. So anything that's high acid, so a high acid food, uh, again, remember pH less than less than or equal to 4.6, the spores aren't really going to germinate and, and be conducive for that bacteria to live in that acidic environment. Uh, we also would have an aerobic environment. So if there's an aerobic environment around, again, that's not going to be very conducive for clostridium botulinum. The other thing that we can do is promote spore destruction. And the spore destruction um, would be uh, in that high temperature, 240 degrees Fahrenheit, that we might achieve in a pressure canner. So that's an um, important way to get rid of that spore, de destroy that spore. Once it's been dis destroyed, it will not germinate into a bacteria. So again, you need that high, high temperature. So what does this previous information mean to me then? Um, as a person that might be interested in processing, uh, one of the things is, is that understanding the, the characteristics of the food and that of Clostridium botulinum is important because it kind of gives you a direction to go with processing. And anytime you have a high acid food, a water bath canner is, is appropriate. So you just have to get to that 212. Remember with Clostridium botulinum, it will not grow in that acidic environment. In contrast, with low acid foods, we have to use then this, the pressure canner. So with low acid foods, you need that higher temperature to inactivate those uh, spores that are in that Clostridium botulinum. So before we get into the separate types of food categories, I want to just refresh uh, the, the, the steps of canning a little bit. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail for you, but when we talk about high and low acid uh, canning methods, uh, there's some common steps. Uh, the, the first thing here is to, it's very important to have uh, cans that are, are structurally sound. If you have cracks or you have nicks on the top surface of that, that uh, jar, yeah, throw it out. Uh, because we know that if there's a nick in that, that um, Lid, uh, the, 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 the top of that uh, jar, uh, it's not going to form a very good seal. And so therefore, um, the food is likely going to spoil just because you weren't able to process it correctly. Also, um, use new flat lids. And, and I kind of stress that a, a few points lower. Um, used ones that have already come off of a jar, uh, basically, they've gone through that process of, of sealing that jar. So when you, you pull it away, some of that plasticizing agent 
uh, might be lost and, and make it ineffective for using reusing these flat lids. So it's important to, to move forward with brand new flat lids. Uh, when it comes to prepping the jars, I always remember warm soapy water, rinse well, that's sufficient. Or if you have a dishwasher, run them through a dishwasher cycle. Um, one of the important things about the, the lids is that you really want to follow the manufacturer's directions in the context of how to handle these lids. Uh, some of the, the, the flat lids only require you to wash them with uh, warm soapy water and rinsing. They don't require a heat treatment. Um, some other brands require a heat treatment. So this is kind of something that's actually been highlighted just recently as being something new as a new recommendation is to just wash them in warm soapy water and then rinse well. Uh, and that you don't have to actually heat these lids. Okay, so that's kind of a new recommendation. Although uh, the Ball website said that they had recommended this back in 1969, but um, I have never been able to find anything about that. But but their new recommendation is now just wash it. You don't really necessarily need to to heat the lids prior to uh, the, the actual canning uh, process. Um, but if you feel comfortable in doing that, just make sure you're not boiling the water and then throwing the lids in this boiling water. You want to avoid that that part. If you want to just have it at a, a warm temperature, uh, that probably would be okay, but, but avoid the boiling process. Also with food preparation, they're, they're, we have two methods that we use for packing the product. We have a cold pack versus the, the hot pack. Uh, remember with cold pack, that's placing that cold food into either cold or warm jars um, and then adding hot liquid to that jar before removing the, the air and sealing. Uh, some of the advantages would be less time consuming for preparation and packing, uh, easier to handle the jars, it's easier to handle a cold jar or, or something that's lukewarm versus burning hot. Um, and, and some foods retain firmness better by doing a cold pack. In a hot pack food, uh, the food is cooked in a liquid before packing. Uh, this is also then a case where you would, you would pour the, the, the liquid and the food into the jar. You would remove the air and then seal that. Uh, there are some advantages. Um, you have fewer jars needed, less floating of the products during and after canning, um, better color and flavor retention, easier to pat that food because it's, it's pliable and then it's, it's uh, faster heating to the target canning temperature because you've already heated that food product. Uh, Another important common step between these two would be that the headspace. And remember that the headspace is just simply that, that space from the bottom of that lid to the basically just slightly above the top of that food product or where that liquid might be. Uh, what's important here is that you know what type of product that you are canning. Um, for gelled uh, fruit products, about a quarter inch. If it's fruits such as tomatoes and pickles, it's about a half inch. Um, and then for low acid foods, it's about a one to one and a quarter inches. And if you don't have this nice little handy tool that measures head space distance, you can actually then use the jar. And on that jar, you can see where a quarter inch is, a half inch, and then one inch. And so it's a nice way that if you don't have that tool, uh, you can just use that as a gauge. Okay, we're not. You don't have to be like 100% accurate when you you do these head spaces, but be as close as possible. So in high acid foods, uh, again, that's where we have the pH of of 4.6 or less. Uh, boiling water bath is sufficient for that task. Um, a couple of things that's important. Um, we want to make sure that, that the, the temperature of that water um, should be about 
180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about simmering. So if you can simmer the, the water before adding it to the, the, the canner, that would uh, be best. Uh, one of the things here to remember is that uh, it helps reduce the processing overall time by having uh, the water that's already close to where it needs to be. One of the problems I sometimes hear people talk about is that they start timing the processing once they have their jars in the, the water. And if that's not boiling, that's not the correct procedure. So it's important then to, to think about, um, think about uh, cases where, where the temperature of the water is important and, and how long you actually process that product. So when we use this water bath canner, what's very important is to get that canner up to temperature as, as with a full boil, because you want to basically be boiling that, because you're, you're dealing with a, a processing temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, or, and that's what you want to aim for. And in this particular scenario, um, once this water is at a full boil, that is actually when you want to start timing. So if it says 20 minutes on the USDA guide, it's once it starts boiling this water that you want to start that timer. What also is important that sometimes people have a tendency to turn down the heat once it's boiling. It's, it's okay to do that if you know your, your, your stove or your, uh, your water bath canner. Because if it stops uh, boiling, you basically have to bring it back up to boiling and then process it for the designated amount of time. So if you boiled for 15 minutes and all of a sudden uh, you walk away and you come back and it's no longer boiling, you don't know when it stopped boiling. So you have to redo that. So it's important just again to recommend to people that keep an eye on that to make sure it boils continually through that recommended processing time. Also remember that that each of the the foods that you would want to make has its own processing time and it has its own directions um, and, and that you want to follow the approved method. And one of the uh, things to remember is that depending on where you live, the processing time might be uh, different. And so it's important to follow your specific uh, guidelines. Uh, one example, if you look at this chart in the corner where we have boiling point of water at various elevations, that if you're living in, in Fargo, um, the, the boiling point of water is actually roughly 99 degrees Celsius. But if I go out to Colorado and decide I want to retire in Colorado, and I'm at 6,000 feet for elevation, now that, that temperature is only 93.3 for water to boil. And so there's a big difference there in the amount of heat in that, that system. And as a result, you actually have to process for a longer time at these higher elevations. So, so keep that in mind is that you want to follow the, the appropriate processing time, processing time and temperature for your specific location. Uh, jar size will impact processing time, so it's important to know, do you have a quart, do you have a pint, do you have a half pint, because in some cases that will affect the processing time. Um, and then, of course, uh, look for sealed jars after it has cooled. Uh, if the, the the lid is curved inward, then you know that you have a vacuum in that, that jar. So just examples where to send people. So if people ask, if they are, are looking at canning fruit and fruit-based products, send them to the USDA uh, uh, processing guide number two. So home canning guide number two is, is for really the, the acid uh, type food products. So when you, when you point them to these, these uh, guidelines, just you know, reinforce to them that, hey, they have recipes there. 
try to follow those recipes uh, the way they have have it written. Um, for example, in this particular product, one of the ingredients is vinegar. So if they say, well, you know what? Oh, I only have a cup of vinegar. Uh, you know, that won't cut it. It's not going to be a sufficient acid in that product. So unless they cut everything else in half, the ratio is not going to be maintained. So it's important that they understand that they need to follow these recipes. These have been proven, proven to be safe. Uh, the nice thing about this guideline also gives you details. So there's enough detail there to tell you how to prep the sample. Um, it tells you about things such as, you know, how much headspace. Uh, they talk about quart jars. They talk about hot fill, et cetera. So it, it's really nice because they provide all the details. So you don't have to memorize, uh, you don't have to memorize every detail for them and you just let them know, okay, this is where you can find that information. And then also when we talk about about this, they also give recommendations for the type of, of style or pack, hot pack, type of jar, pints, half pints versus quarts. You can see that there's different temperatures and or different times. With different elevations, there's also different times of processing. So it's important then that uh, just Point them into the direction is important. So there is a question, uh, does processing over a recommended time hurt anything or does it damage quality? And um, it's really only a quality. From a safety perspective, um, because you've already allotted that specific amount of time for processing, safety-wise it's okay. It's just that by over overdoing it sometimes you can damage the quality. So maybe the quality might not be as good. Uh, so it is a case where um, I wouldn't overdo it in a sense. If you're over by a few minutes or so, you're probably okay. Even maybe five minutes, you're probably okay. But but once you start going excessively long, then you're clearly going to have, you know, a, maybe a leaching of the, the nutrients more into to the liquid aspect of that, that sample. So let's shift gears and move into um, into the low acid foods. With uh, low acid foods, remember greater than pH 4.6, we must achieve a temperature of 240 degrees Fahrenheit or 115 Celsius. It's always important to remember um, that you have a pressure cooker and you have a pressure canner. And it's always important that a pressure cooker is great for if you have a tough piece of meat, a roast of some sort, and you want to make it a little bit more tender before you eat it, that's great. You can make it in a pressure cooker. But if you want to can and preserve food, you need to use a pressure canner. So that's uh, the important distinction between these uh, two types of pressure devices, okay? So again, remember, pressure canners are the rec uh, recommended uh, pressure vessels to use uh, when you're using low acid foods. It's important to understand that pressure is more easily controlled through heat input. Uh, so by changing the, the, the temperature of your stove top, it's easier to control that pressure inside the vessel. So we don't oftentimes use temperature as a way to regulate uh, that cooking process. Instead, we, we monitor the pressure. What's really important to remember is that in a, in a pressure canner, we are relying on saturated steam to drive this heat penetration and spore destruction. That's what we really need. We need a saturated steam. And when we plot out uh, temperature versus uh, pressure, we can see that at, at basically uh, zero or atmospheric pressure, which would be what we would use in water bath canner, as we increase the pressure, so as we go in this direction with pressure, you can see that there's this gradual increase up to about 160 degrees Celsius. That's when you have 70 pounds of pressure. It's important to recognize that in home canners, they are designed only to be um, right around uh, 
up to 20 PSI. And then they actually get into, at 20 PSI, they actually get into uh, the point of that danger zone on a pressure gauge. So if you have a, a pressure gauge on your uh, pressure canner, that 20, shortly after that, it gets into a high pressure state. And, and that's when you would have concerns that that your safety valves would, would pop open and so forth. Uh, so we deal with canning in a very small range from 10 PSI up to about, you know, 15 or 16. And, and under those conditions, at 11 PSI, we are at, um, so at 11 PSI, we are basically dealing with um, about 115 degrees or 115.5 degrees Celsius. So that's that temperature that we, we need to achieve spore destruction. As we move up and we get uh, to like 15 PSI, then we're at about 120, 121 degrees Celsius. So those are the, the small ranges that we have to deal with to get to the right temperatures to destroy those spores. Uh, again, high pressures are become a safety issue for your well-being. Um, there's also a question here about uh, box elder maple syrup, pH 5.2 to 5.4. Any hope for canning? Um, one of the things, anytime you're dealing with, with a, a syrup, um, with many syrups, they are concentrated, or the sugar is concentrated to a, a high sugar percentage. Uh, so if if this this maple uh, syrup is concentrated to a sugar level about uh, 67 percent, it then becomes more of a sugar being the driver for the preservation of that product. Um, if it if it is more liquid in nature, um, then maybe a, a, a canning process might be applicable. But because it might have a high sugar, you'd have to be careful about it browning too much. So a few other things, uh, a few other things uh, basically would be that in a, in a pressure canner, Remember that the water should not cover the jars, so you don't need the, in this particular case, you can see on one side that there's water over the jars. In another case, that water is only about two to three inches uh, from the bottom of the vessel. That's all you really need. Because remember, you're relying on saturated steam. Uh, the saturated steam is um, essentially uh, what is driving this, this destruction of that organism. Uh, stacking of jars is permissible. So in this particular case, um, you can stack those, or I usually use um, this basically this jar or this uh, this additional rack in there. So where I put a, this rack on top of one layer of jars, and then put my next layer of jars on top of that. In a boiling water bath, it's difficult to do that because jars tend to to tip over and so forth, and so it becomes an issue that um, is not desirable. So just to remember with the, the pressure canner, some of the key things to when you use a pressure canner is that you want to vent that. Uh, so you want to vent the uh, canner for about 10 minutes. Uh, it's also called exhausting. So if you see exhausting or venting, they're basically the same, same terminology. Um, it's important because you want this environment within this canner to be a saturated steam. And what we have known is that when you have mixtures of air in steam, it affects the actual temperature in that, that canner. So once you start venting it, keep in mind, again, this idea that if there's air in that, that steam, it's going to affect the overall temperature. And with this particular graph, graph we can see that 0% uh, air, 5% air, 10% air, and 15% air. So that's what these different lines represent. Um, so when we're at 5 
pounds of pressure, and we have 0% air, we have a temperature of about 106, but when we have 15% air in that, we're at a value of about 104. So as you go up to 10, so getting closer to our canning pressure requirements, you can see that, that at, when you have 15% air in that, it's about 110, but when you have 0%, you're at about 115 for a temperature. So it's very important to, to vent or exhaust that, that canner just because it affects the temperature of that, that um, steam in that vessel. Um, again, when some of the things that are important to make sure that when you um, adjust the pressure, you do this by adjusting the burner temperature. So that's how you can control that. Uh, you don't want to really be adjusting your pressure by pulling off the, 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 the gauge or the weight on that, that particular unit. You want to do it by um, changing the temperature of that, that stovetop. Also, um, Keep in mind that the magic pressure is typically 11 pounds uh, per square inch, and that if the pressure drops during any of that processing, you have to basically reprocess that product at the appropriate 11 PSI. So it's important to, to maybe not walk away while you're doing this, but to kind of keep an eye on that, that pressure. What's also important Again, just like in, in acid food production, each food has its own processing time, um, and there are approved um, approaches or methods, so it's important to, to keep that in mind. One of the keys here with low acid food production is the amount of pressure that's in your pressure canner. Uh, if it's 2,000 feet or less, typically 11 PSI on the gauge, is appropriate. However, as you go up to six to eight thousand feet, that number has to jump up to about fourteen. So again, keep in mind where are you canning? Is it going to be in Colorado? Is it going to be in North Dakota? So on a dial gauge, we can see that that number. If it's a weighted gauge instrument, then anything over a thousand feet and above, you would use the fifteen uh, psi gauge weight for that instrument. So that's uh, important things to keep in mind as people are processing uh, products. Another thing that's very important is do not force cool this, this canner because people sometimes get impatient and like, why isn't it dropping? Why isn't the pressure dropping? You'll sit there and look at it every two seconds and it's not dropping. So it's, it's a case where it's important not to force cool it because part of that cool down process is, is considered important to that overall processing of that product. Uh, so don't take your pressure cooker and dump cold water on it or touch it with a cold rag or anything because you're, you're, going to, to, you're going to see a pressure drop, no doubt about it. But one of the other problems is, is that some of the liquid might come shooting out of the, the, the jars. So it doesn't take much to lift up that lid and it just has to be a small amount and then the liquid can, can be drawn out. So it's important not to try to cool too fast. So again, guide number four is one that we use for canned vegetables and vegetable products. So remember with fruits, it was, it was guide two. Uh, vegetables, it's guide number four. And again, it has some of the same type of information, uh, the, the uh, procedures, hot pack, raw pack information. And then this is a little bit blurry, but it has uh, processing times, uh, different elevations, has different, different processing requirements. So it's important that when people maybe ask you, make sure that they understand that they need to kind of know a little bit about where they live and, and what is the appropriate um, pressure and times to use. And this is just another one with beans. You can see that very similar type of information. Again, pints versus quarts, um, processing time, 20, 25 minutes, 
uh, it can be a hot pack or a raw pack. So again, it's a case where it provides that type of information. Uh, so moving on, I'll spend the next maybe five minutes here with with kind of finishing up on this internet canning. Um, you know, what is internet canning? This is kind of a, a term we kind of coined around NDSU in the small group that's working with, with this canning area. Uh, these are basically canning of foods using unproven methods, and it's usually posted on the internet. So that's what kind of we call it internet canning, is because these are methods that people are posting either in blogs or comments, etc. So it's important to, you know, know what's out there. That what are people doing? Because it's important to to know that um, if the method is unsafe, it's it's something that we want to steer people away from. We don't want them to be following that. Uh, so the first one here is this boiling water bath canner. And this is true for low acid foods. Remember, boiling water bath canning is fine for high acid foods. But for low acid foods, we want uh, to stay away from this type of method. Um, commenters on some of these blogs, some of the, the in the comment sections of some pages, talk about it's an old family recipe, my family's been eating it for 100 years and no one's died, old cookbooks and so forth. So these are things that to be very wary of. Um, some methods say three minutes, some say three hours. So it, it's a case where very inconsistent uh, in, in what they say. Um, oven canning is another one. Um, it was, unfortunately, uh, the USDA approved it between 31 or 1931 and 1942, um, but they fortunately found out in 42 that maybe it shouldn't be approved, and, and so it's been off the USDA's approved list for a long time. Um, oftentimes, uh, bloggers tend to make this about tradition. They make it about some emotional connection, and so it's important not to fall trapped to that. Instead look at it from a scientific perspective, a food safety perspective. Uh, one of the comments that today is still one of my favorites is that um, is one individual that talks about the boiling point at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if it's in the oven at 250 degrees for four hours, that allows for plenty of time for the, the jars to be not only hot enough, but fully, fully cooked. And it really shows just a lack of knowledge regarding food safety and and how boiling water baths are just not high enough to get to that uh, spore inactivation level. Um, but what's also interesting here is that this individual equates something that's cooked with that of of being preserved. So that's something that needs to, you need to differentiate as well. Uh, dishwasher canning, I'm not going to mention here, this was kind of a fad that we saw for a couple of years. People were running it through their dishwasher cycle. They would fill it hot, pack it, throw it in the dishwasher, run the cycle in sealed jars, and that's what they would do. Um, again, not done very much anymore that I've seen lately. Um, and then atmospheric canning. Atmospheric canning uh, was not recommended um, uh, really until... Um, 1936, however, um, there's been a lot of conflicting reports about its effectiveness. However, the University of Wisconsin is putting together some guidelines for the use of atmospheric steam canning. It seems to be um, acceptable maybe for some uh, acidified foods and acid food products, but it's definitely not acceptable for low acid canning. And hopefully more guidelines will come out in the near future here. Um, some experiments we did at NDSU, we looked at pressure canning, boiling water bath, oven, and then atmospheric canning. These are techniques that we used. Um, we then uh, looked at, uh, using a, a thermocouple, we looked at what were the temperatures in the canner versus the, the food product. And we saw with the pressure cooker, you can see that by following the green line here, you can see that the temperature was up in that sterilization zone of, of 115. Uh, the canner was at about 120. Um, but when we used the boiling water bath canner, our green line shows that we did not really achieve 100 degrees um, for the boiling water bath canner. 
So again, that's not going to be enough to kill spores. Um, and again, with oven canning and steam canning, we found basically similar trends. With oven canning, we were really never close to uh, being at 100 for very long. And also, again, remember, we need to achieve 115, so we're a long way from that. And then also with steam canning, uh, we did see that there was a, a period of time where it did achieve 100 degrees Celsius, but again, it doesn't reach that 115 needed for low acid foods. Uh, and then with the microorganism of interest, you can see that the pressure can was the only one that really effectively reduced the number of microorganisms in that, that sample. Okay, the other methods did not, yes, we saw reductions, but it was not really effective uh, with this particular organism. So what we found here is that the only uh, method that was appropriate was to follow the USDA method of 20 minutes at 11 PSI. That would be this, the uh, sample B. Um, yes, it looks a little bit brown compared to the other samples, but it's important to recognize that um, with these other methods, it's about food safety and not about, about color. So, so again, keep that in mind that these other methods might give you a prettier product, but they're going to be less safe um, and, and could potentially be cause death. So again, uh, just to kind of wrap up here in the next minute or so, uh, I always recommend people that are interested in doing canning to go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, start to look through some of the guidelines. I think that's a good place for them to start. There's just so much information there. Uh, they could probably find something that they actually want to, to make that's actually present in some of the, that material. Uh, Julie also has a food nutrition site for food preservation, so a lot of different uh, little newsletters there. Uh, I also found recently that Ball, they have their freshpreserving.com, is also a very good site. Uh, they provide a lot of good details, a lot of, of, of recipes uh, that are, have been proven. So, so it's really a good site to even direct them to that. Of course, they have information or, or ads that they want you to buy their product, but I still I think it provides very good information. Um, and then knowing who you're selling your product to, if it's North Dakota, again, the state uh, health department is, is important there. If it's going to go across to Minnesota or to South Dakota, Montana, or through the internet, you need to start thinking about the FDA and their role in jurisdiction over your product. And a couple of weeks ago, David Sikowski had talked about regulations and so forth. Uh, again, additional resources uh, you can find on the entrepreneurial uh, uh, website that Julie puts together. Um, and then, again, this is a, the, the last uh, presentation will be next week. Uh, so the last webinar will be next week on, on gardening. Uh, so make sure you plan to attend that one. And then with that, I want to acknowledge the, the National Center for home food preservation for a lot of the, the material that I used in this presentation. And then with that, um, I will end and kind of if anybody has any additional questions, I can answer those. Or if you think of something, you can always send me an email. And with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thanks so much, Cliff. You covered a lot of ground in an hour. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> You can certainly contact either of us. Um, as I've been writing you some notes, we have a lot of information, including a, a little module all about food preservation and food processing. And I hope whoever asked the question about maple syrup checks out that link that I had up earlier it's from the University of Wisconsin and kind of walks through the process of stabilizing syrup. Seems to have disappeared from the okay. <laughs> from view, but. Yeah. Yeah, because there is one question here about uh, examples of, of 
or two of, of something that could be cold packed. Um, actually, I, I think if you go to the USDA uh, site, they do have some products that can be both hot packed and cold packed. Um, I've I've seen people cold pack green beans because they want something that's a little bit firmer. Um, me personally, I don't do any, I don't usually can uh, like peas or, or green beans. Um, I usually freeze those, but, but I've seen people in the past do green beans just because they want it to be a little bit firmer. All right. Well, we've missed our, or we've reached our 3 p.m., which I always try to keep these at an hour. So thanks to everyone for joining us, and thank you, Cliff, for doing a webinar. Uh, again, feel free to contact us if you want more resources. There's a lot of resources in this area, but unfortunately, there are a lot of resources that are not based on science. So be careful in what you find about food preservation because we want all of you to enjoy safe food products.